my life's kind of been a bull ride, and uh, it's been like that. That was in Denver, actually, that um, ride that I did there. That bull's name is Painted Warrior, and you learn a lot when you get on a bull, and bull riding is, is facing opposition. And you know, the Bible calls us to be overcomers, not succumbers. And so when you ride bulls, you, you experience pressure. And I learned more about fear through riding bulls than anything ever. And, um, and how to face fear. And when life throws you lemons, you need to make lemonade. You need to press against what's pressing you. And I went through a similar experience that uh, Co- Pastor Colby did as well. And to see what God's unfolded on the other side of it is just absolutely unreal and amazing. And um, I want to let you know tonight that your greatest misery to de- today can be your best mi- ministry tomorrow. That your mess today can be your message tomorrow. Um, I've seen God be so faithful when I thought that there was no way out. I didn't think that there was light at the other end of the tunnel. And it was it Pastor Jeff? Is that what it is? Or that you were talking about? No, Pastor Fred. Pastor Fred, the one that wouldn't stand up. <laughs> you should stand up, Pastor, because it's men like you who came alongside me as well and held my arms up and uh, made all the biggest difference in the world. And the reason why I married that woman is because she wouldn't leave my side either. <laughs> When everybody else was wanting to throw rocks, she was wanting to show me the love of the Father. And I think it's so uncanny, this weekend, uh, we're going to talk about God's love, the Father's love in particular, and we're going to talk about the Father tonight. And I'm so excited to do that, because when you're going through your hardest moments in life, you don't need condemnation. You don't need people telling you what you're doing wrong. I love Mike Tyson's quote. He said, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> and I thought, I thought I knew how I would respond if anything like what I was going through ever happened to me. And don't ever curse somebody that's in something that you haven't endured. Because you haven't been in their shoes. And you don't know what it's like. You may have been in something similar, but you don't know exactly what it's like. And please don't say that to somebody that's had somebody die or something. I know exactly what you're feeling. You don't. We're all cut from a different cloth. And there was people I'd watch and they'd, you know, go through some sort of a tribulation like that. And don't ever mistake uh, tribulation as somebody who's sinning. Because just because somebody's going through something bad doesn't mean that they sinned to get to something bad. Job didn't do anything wrong. He was the most righteous man in the East. And you know what he did and what he didn't do? It's not what Job did that's the moral of the story. It's what Job didn't do. He didn't curse God when he was going through hell in the hallway. And so when somebody else is going through hell in the hallway and all their friends are going, whoa, they must have sinned, they must have sinned. Uh, you just persevere because people will misinterpret your trials and when they're wanting to count it all crud you count it all joy because like my brother you'll come out on the other side praise God and there's a lot God wants to say tonight but I need to get to my message or I will preach and not get to the message (laughs) and I know that God has a message for you tonight so can we pray that was for free that was the preliminary (laughs) I don't even know what that means. (laughs) Father, we thank you so much that you are a good, good father and that you love us despite. And I pray that we walk out of here with a revelation from heaven that we've never seen before, that we can say, surely we've met with you. I pray, God, that your presence is so tangible tonight that we leave forever altered. If there's healing, that the people will be healed. If there's deliverance needed, deliverance will happen. If there's joy, joy will be imparted. There's peace and contentment that's missing that may it be fulfilled tonight. We love you, we honor you, and we recognize you as the sole source of all things. You are El Shaddai, the all-sufficient God. And we receive that and worship you in Jesus' name. And all who agreed said, amen. You know, I was getting ready to uh, speak 
tonight for this message. Pastor Colby said that he was going to open it up to everyone. And I thought, praise God for that. And it occurred to me that I was going to be preaching on 316. Happy 316, everyone. I bet you going to guess what scripture I'm going to go to tonight. <laughs> yeah, I'm going there. I know it sounds a little corny, a little trite. But I want you to turn to John 316. Probably never read this scripture before. <laughs> Probably never heard it. Never seen it anywhere. I don't know if it, if it weren't for Tim Tebow, I don't know if we'd know what this scripture is, right? Thank God for Tim Tebow. Very familiar verse. Very familiar verse. And a very familiar verse all by itself. But in context, is the most pivotal chapter for the revelation of the love of the Father and the kingdom of God. Can I tell you that Jesus came to impart two things to the world? Number one, that God is not just God, he's Father. Our Father who art in heaven. The Pharisees could not stand that. Because they were so reverent to the name of God, they wouldn't even voice it. And yet Jesus shows up saying, God's our Father. And they're going, what? Are you kidding me? This most holy, reverent God, you're going to call him Father? They went as far as to say, you're blaspheming. But the greatest revelation Jesus came to sire to the planet was that God's our Father, the God of the universe. And your perspective on that is important. And I'll tell you why in a moment. The second greatest revelation that Jesus came to, to impart into the earth, and this all goes along with the Lord's Prayer, by the way, is that there's a kingdom that's in heaven that God wants us to manifest here on the earth. Yes. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. How? As it is in heaven. Sorry, ladies, but gentlemen, you're going to hear this weekend from me the where, when, why, and how. And, we're gonna, and, and the who, sorry. Who, where, when, and why. That's what we're going to talk about. Tonight, we're going to start with who. You go down the Lord's Prayer and you see the basis of what God wanted to do. The first thing that we have to grasp before we get any insight on the kingdom of God is the revelation that God's our Father. If we don't get that button in the right hole, then we will distort the kingdom of God and turn it into logistical, mundane principles that are legal in nature. If you've ever met a legal Christian, you have met somebody that does not understand the love of the Father because knowledge puffs up, love builds up. And I'm about done with pastors touting messages of knowledge without the love of God. Right. Speak the truth in love. And you can be theologically adept and pontificate all over your congregation with how you've exegeted a certain scripture and how hermeneutically sound it is. And be so far from the love of God that nobody wants to even be around you. And I am tired of that. Because the benchmark of the kingdom of God is love. Not tolerance, but love. Big difference. <laughs> Big difference. We've got a world full of tolerance. Love speaks the truth and rejoices in the truth. Love never fails. Love is kind. Love is full of joy. Love is full of peace. Love keeps no records of wrongs. Wait a second. I know a whole bunch of record of wrong pastors. Y'all been sinning in here. Ha! I told you I was from the South too sometimes. I can preach like that, you know, get my motor running. Ha! What you looking at tonight? Can I get that name, man? When I go down south, man, they get all, one lady, she had her handkerchief, said, we need this, y'all, preach it, pass up, preach it. I love that stuff. God's love 
is the first revelation that we need to understand before we ever get into kingdom things. The kingdom of God is not heaven. It's a piece of heaven. I might say some very controversial things that you can go look up for yourself. But let me just, let me bring to light a few things here. Our Father who art in, hallowed be thy name. Who's at his right hand? Jesus. But he sent the Holy Spirit to the earth, right? And the, the Holy Spirit, as Jesus stands at the right hand of the Father making intercession for the saints, or actually sitting at the right hand of the Father, the Holy Spirit sits at the right hand of our heart making intercession to us about Jesus. That's an awesome picture of the Holy Spirit. He's the greatest friend you got. He's your greatest asset. Don't put the Holy Spirit in the closet. We treat him like Cousin It from the Adams family. We don't know what he is. We call him an it all the time. And if we really became his friend and realized how important he is to our life, that he's our helpmate, our standby, our counselor, our guide. He was the one sent and he said, Jesus said, he'll remind you of my way of life. I mean, we got a, we got a huge asset in the Holy Spirit. And he brings life to the kingdom of God. Now for years, I would read scriptures like, hey, don't be looking for the kingdom there, or looking for the kingdom here. For I tell you, the kingdom of God is within you. Wait a second. Most of the time, when I read the words kingdom of God, I thought of heaven right away. And especially in this chapter, where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, we got this whole doctrine formed that says that you must be born again to go to heaven off of the dialogue with Nicodemus. But did you know that Jesus wasn't talking to Nicodemus about going to heaven? Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about how he was doing those miracles he was doing. Nicodemus and his little clan was jealous of Jesus because his church was getting bigger than theirs. And they had a great children's program, but they had no power. And so he comes up and he says, hey, you got to be from God because these miracles wouldn't be happening if God weren't with you. And Jesus goes, that's right. And unless you're born again, you can't see, perceive, look into the kingdom of God. Listen, this wasn't a guy that was desperate to get to heaven and he was a sinner just trying to find out the gospel. This was a religious Jewish leader that knew everything there is to know about Moses and the Mosaic law and Judaism. And he, he, was, he wasn't concerned about getting to heaven. He thought he was going. I don't know a religious person that doesn't think they're going to heaven. So he wasn't coming to Jesus saying, what must I do to be saved? He was coming to Jesus saying, hey, what's your secret? And Jesus says to him, you got to be born again to see and perceive into this kingdom, right? And he goes, it flips Nicodemus out so much, in fact, that he goes, um, you mean I got to enter into my mother's womb a second time? Can you imagine his thought process? <laughs> like, I bet Jesus was like, uh, yeah, let's not go there. Okay, gross. Um, he says, no, I tell you the truth. Unless you're born of the water and of the spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Once again, not talking about heaven. We've all put it up in the sweet by and by. I'll fly away high in the sky, dancing and tiptoeing the roses through Je with Jesus. When the whole time Jesus was saying, hey, if you want to enter into the kingdom right here on the earth, because thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What's that called? What's that called? It's the kingdom of God. See, when you say kingdom of heaven, it's limited to a locale. Our father who art in heaven. The kingdom that's up there is in that's in heaven. That's the kingdom of heaven. When you say kingdom of God, it's not limited to there. It's a part of there, but it's not limited to there. It's here too. And so what do we call thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What do we call that? I call it the kingdom of God. And what Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about was not how to get to heaven, but how to enter in to that power and authority that he was in where signs, wonders, and miracles could happen. And Jesus said, you can't even perceive it. You can't even look into it unless you're born again. And furthermore, you can't even enter it until you're born of the water and the spirit, which are two of the three keys of the kingdom. Repent, be baptized, and be filled. Peter had them on the day of Pentecost. 
So he was saying, and, and, and don't misunderstand me here. I'm not saying that water baptism and being filled with the Spirit gets you into heaven. I'm saying they are keys that open up and unlock the vaults of heaven for you on the earth. They're for the earth. I don't get water baptized to go to heaven. I get water baptized to restore my authority that Adam lost in the garden so I can walk in power right here on the planet in the kingdom of God. So we have this whole dialogue and then it leads up to the 16th verse where he says a remarkable passage. Oh my goodness. I don't know. Verse 14, has anybody ever seen a paramedic's patch on their arm? You know what it is? One of them? It's a serpent wrapped around a pole. You know what that is? That's Jesus. I got knock, knocked out on a bowl one time in pier. Bam, knocked me cold. His number was 2787. And he'd come out and he'd buck real fast and turn back to the left. And I was riding him. All of a sudden he stops in the middle of the ride. That's not good. Because when you got 2,000 pounds of meat that stops, it's like putting on your emergency brake and then hitting the gas. He stopped and then he hit the gas. And what did I do? Re whap! <laughs> hit heads. And there I was, knocked out. Well, the, I woke up to the paramedic going, hey, you all right? You all right? Hey. And I was like, oh. And I, the, the first thing was this patch on his arm. And I went, oh, Jesus. He's like, take him to the hospital. He's whacking out. Why is that Jesus? Why is that a symbol of Jesus? Well, because way back in the, in the olden days, when Moses was leading the children of Israel across the desert, they were murmuring and complaining. Man, you want to get on the backside of God? Start murmuring and complaining. And it'll be your doing. They, they took an 11-day journey and turned it into 40 years because of murmuring and complaining. And they got to murmuring and complaining and cursing God's goodness so much and his love that snakes came out and started biting them. And can you imagine? Come on up here, Taylor and Rhea. Well, you might as well come up here too, babe. Just imagine a family that we're all walking across the desert and we're a part of this church of Moses, right? Right here in Sioux Falls. And we're, as we're walking across the desert, you know, Taylor's going, man, I don't know about this God thing. It's just, and I'm going, yeah, I know. We've been out here in the desert and it's blowing snow all the time. And we're, <laughs> I don't know if God's good. And all of a sudden we get bit by snakes. They, th these snakes started to come up and they started to bite us. Well, what happened is all the people started dying, instantly got bit by a snake and they die. Moses freaks out. He starts interceding for his church and he says, God, what do I do? And God says, let me tell you what to do. Go get a pole and take a snake, a bronze serpent, craft it, wrap it around the pole, twist it around the pole. That's why I believe when Jesus hung on the cross, he was twisted. We'll get to that later. And twist it around the pole and prop it up. And when anybody gets by a, hit by a snake, you, you, you stare at it. So imagine us just walking across the desert. Here we go. Mm -ts, mm -ts, mm -ts. And, and all of a sudden, wham, he gets bit by a snake. Wham, I get bit by a snake. Wham, she gets bit by a snake. And we go, ah. And she goes, dad, what do we do? I say, look at the pole. Look at the pole. Look at the pole. I don't know how long they looked at the pole, but. Listen to this. They had to stare at the pole until they were healed. They had to stare at the pole until they were healed. Could have been two days. Could have been two hours. I don't know how long. But however long, until they knew they were healed, they had to stare at the pole. All right? Give them a hand clap just for their... Look at this scripture. Just as Moses lifted up a snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Hmm, Jesus was lifted up on a pole too. Somebody says, yeah, but Jesus wasn't a snake. Oh, but he became a snake. He who knew no sin 
became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus became sin for us. So metaphorically speaking, what that serpent was on a pole was Jesus on the cross. And then look at the next verse. For God so loved the world that everyone that should believe in him shall have eternal life. Look what it says in verse 15. Therefore, everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Okay, did you see that there? Check this out. Just as Moses lifted up a serpent on a pole and said, if you get bit, you got to stare at it till you're healed. So Jesus will be lifted up on a pole that whosoever stares at him will have eternal life. Did you get that? Believe doesn't just mean mental assent. Believe means I look at Jesus all through my life. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Part of being faithful to God is staring at the pole all my life. I never lose sight of Jesus. Sorry, young people, but just saying a sinner's prayer and coming up to the altar at Bible camp isn't going to keep you with Jesus. It's going to be a life of staring at the pole. That's what believe really means. There's some people that think that just because they went to Bible camp and mumbled a sinner's prayer that they're going to have eternal life. No, he's the author and the perfecter of my faith. And when I stand before him, I'm going to either hear, depart from me, I don't even know you, we didn't spend any time together, or well done, thou good and faithful person that looked at the pole all the way through their lives. Believe. Stare at the pole. Amen. Amen. Don't take your eyes off Jesus. Wasn't that the message to Peter when he was walking on water? Don't take your eyes off of me. You keep them on me. And as long as you keep them on me, you'll do the supernatural. But if you take your eyes off me and start doing it yourself, you're going to do the superficial. Ooh. But here's what I want to go to. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. I love that little word, so. Teenagers say it a lot now. I was like so, like so happy and so full of life. I'm just so full of joy. <laughs> it's a little thing that we add to add intensity, right? We know that Adam and Eve messed this whole thing up, right? We know that in the garden, it got all messed up. But the Bible says that despite the fact that it was all messed up, God so loved the world. Can I just tell you that God doesn't just so love you? I, t I tell that to my kids sometimes. I don't just love you. I so love you. I so love you. And I'm thankful that I had a dad that told me that all the time. I had a mom that told me that all the time. My parents were awesome with telling us that we were loved, we were important, we were, we were gonna be something. But my wife, on the other hand, never knew her dad. As a matter of fact, the closest she was to her real dad was when she got his ashes in the mailbox after he died. He never asked her about her birthday, never inquired about her graduating. And so... As she grew, she didn't know what a real father was like. So it was hard for her to connect that there's a father in heaven that so loves her. Because usually how our earthly father is is how we translate our heavenly father. And so I would attribute a lot of my heavenly father and what he was like to how my dad was to me. And sometimes there was things that my dad did that my heavenly father would never do, you know. But thankful we, we have an a earthly representation of what a father is, but they're not perfect. Praise God that we can allow them that mercy <laughs> a little bit. But nonetheless, it was hard for Jamie to know that God so loves her 
And then when something would go wrong in her life, she would think, well, that's just the father because that's, you know, my father doesn't care for me or he's disciplining me because I'm bad. Or can I just say that God loves you despite anything that's going on in your life? You want me to prove it? There's scripture found in Romans. It's Romans chapter five, verse eight. Look what it says. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. As a matter of fact, go to a little bit uh, before it and it says, God demonstrates his love for us. This is how God demonstrates his love for us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Can I just say, while we were at our worst, Christ was at his best? Listen, Jesus died for you way before you ever committed a sin. So his love for you isn't based on your performance. That's liberating. Can I get an amen? How many have gone through their Christian life thinking, if I did something bad today, I got to do something good tomorrow because God's a little ticked at me right now? <laughs> have you? And, and, and we get like that. Even as parents, it's hard for me to be like God's to my kids because I like to hold grudges. <laughs> like, Rhea, you spilled the milk three times in a row this week. God's not like that because love doesn't keep record of wrongs. So God's not drumming up your past. As a matter of fact, he's throwing it into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered again. Grasp that. Grasp that. So uh, uh, somebody might uh, ridiculously say, well, then if God doesn't look at our bad, then should we just do bad that he might look good? And like the apostle Paul said, God forbid, your condemnation is deserved. You don't do bad because God is not judging you based on your bad. You actually do good. That should make you want to do good, right? right? Let me just say this. There will be people that Jesus will say to them, depart from me, I don't even know you. Because they didn't have a prolific relationship with God. But that doesn't mean that God ever loved them less. People that go to hell... God didn't send them there. They sent themselves there by failure to receive everything Jesus did for them. And God will have tears in his eyes for those who went to hell on their own volition because he paid every price to pay for them to be with him for eternity. It'll be just as grievous for God to see people go to hell as it will for anybody else because they had the opportunity to go to heaven not based on their performance, but based on Jesus's. Amen. Amen. Wow. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I want you to get something out of here you might not have seen. The word so, it's unconditional. Uh, I know it's the word agapeo, which comes from the word agape. God's love is always agape. Amen? He's not limited to human love. God's love is always unconditional. So when the Bible says God so loves you, it's his love is pursuing you despite. Remember the prodigal son? He went and did all kinds of bad with the father's inheritance. And what, did the, what was the father's response? I'll tell you what I'd have done if my son would have take, taken my money and went and spent it on a bunch of bad stuff and he'd have come home. I said, well, who do you think you are? What did the father do? Come here. Grabs him, hugs him, pulls him in, tells him, quick, get a ring, get a robe. Get some sandals. Let's celebrate. My son was lost. Now he's found. He's dead. Now he's alive. The older brother had a fit. We're going to talk about that tomorrow night. The older brother had a fit and was like, this, is how, this isn't how we treat sinners. And the younger brother was thankful and the father loved unconditionally. 
for God so loved the world. This word world is really interesting because it doesn't just speak of us. It speaks of God's order and us and its inhabitants. When God created the earth, he made it just the way he wanted it and he put people in it just the way he wanted them. And he said, it is good. You know what? God's passionate about that. Have you ever made something and you're really passionate about it? Your wife thinks it's ugly, but you made it. God's passionate about the way he created things and the order that he made them in and the way he made man. And it's not that just God just loves people. It's that God so loved the cosmos. He so loved his order. He so loved the way that he created it that he went ahead and gave his one and only son that whosoever shall stare at him like the serpent at the pole shall have eternal life with him in his order and with his love. Isn't that awesome? Say it with me, I'm loved. loved. Do you believe it? Really? You're loved. You're part of the beloved. I love if you, if you take the word beloved and you put a hyphen in between, it's be loved. Be loved. We need to learn how to be loved. Because a lot of us have a conditional basis Christianity. Do bad, get bad, do good, get good. And God says, I love you. I love you. Well, what if I do bad? Well, we'll work it out, but that doesn't mean I love you less. Well, what if I, what if I go off the rails? Well, we'll work it out. We'll make sure you get back on track, but it doesn't mean I love you less. I have a friend that he's quickly coming up in our church and, um, I met him at the YMCA. I went through, uh, a horrible divorce as well. Found out, uh, that, Um, things were going on in my marriage that were beyond my notice. And when I found it all out, I tried to bring restoration and, and get back to a place where, you know, we could just roll on, things could be forgiven, people make mistakes, etc. And I found out that the other side wasn't going to reciprocate. And so it was devastating to me. And I went through, I, I, I lost a lot of of what I had worked so hard for. I felt like I was at the pinnacle of spiritual success and and I was just, yes, I finally made it. And then boom, everything just went and crumbled down. And I did, I felt like Job in the middle, scraping my sores with pottery. I'm not comparing myself to Job, but I, I, I can understand maybe what he felt like as he was scraping his sores with pottery saying, God, why is this happening to me? And his wife's even saying, curse God and die. And he's going, no, I won't, but I don't understand this. And I felt felt that same way. And I went to the Y and I started boxing the bag, not because I wanted to box, but because I wanted to hit something. And I had a a specific person's face in mind. (laughs) The one that intervened and started to, what I thought, destroy my family. And so I'm at the Y and I'm in front of the bag, wham! wham, 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 wham. And I mean, I'm just hitting it, you know, and I wanted to get in shape, but I had that guy's face right there. Wham, wham. And this guy comes over to me and he's like, dude, why are you hitting that bag so hard? And I said, it's personal. Wham, wham. And he's like, okay, you want to talk about it? I said, well, it's the guy that ruined my family. He goes, okay, do your thing. <laughs> and he come up to me a little bit later and he said, well, you know, you don't have to hit the b- boxing. You don't have to hit the bag so hard. And I said, you know, yeah, I know. He said, well, I'm a boxing instructor and, and I can help you box a little bit. And uh, I said, well, I'm a pastor. And he kind of gave me this, oh, whatever. And uh, we, we kind of started a relationship. Well, he was a pastor in New York, youth pastor. Somebody lied about him, got him fired, and he hated God. And he thought God let him down. 
And we got to talking and I just kept loving on him. I just kept telling him, there's a grace on your life. And I could see it. I said, there's a grace on your life, man. Oh yeah, don't give me all that stuff. I said, no, seriously. God's gonna restore some things. Oh, he hasn't restored it in this many years. Well, all of a sudden, we part ways. He starts his boxing uh, thing. He was working as a nurse and doing the boxing thing. And he goes off to do his own business. And uh, he shows up at our church one day. And he's sitting there and he's watching me preach and you know, hearing me preach. And he kind of has this disgruntled look on his face. And I see him put his hands down like that. And uh, I thought he was going to leave. Well, he comes up right at the end of the service and he wants to get baptized. And so I baptize him. And uh, he's shaking the whole time. He told me after I baptized him, he said, I was just about ready to leave. I didn't want to hear this anymore. And I went to walk out the door and God shoved me up to the front. <laughs> and so now he's, he's restoring his relationship with God. And Taylor played football and his son was playing football too. And we we're sitting on the bleachers and he started telling me his whole story. And he, he spilled his guts. He said, I had an affair on my wife and I messed it all up. And um, God, I don't think likes me very much anymore. And I sent up a quick wire, just that quick. And I said, God, what do you think about him? And I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, Tim, tell him I love him just as much now as I did before he messed up. I thought, is that theologically correct? I don't want to be given false hope here. You sure that's the Holy Spirit, not an evil spirit? Yeah, the devil's going to tell you. I said to him, Ryan, I just heard the Lord say that he loves you just as much now as he did before you messed up. And he said, you're messing with me, Pastor. And he started crying. And I can't tell you how many times God's used that little thing to minister to people. There is consequences for sin. There is consequences for doing bad. But God's love toward you is not based on your performance. And until you get that God so loves you and his whole intent is for you to fulfill your purpose, until you get that, you'll never enter into the kingdom of God and make any substantial difference. Because God's kingdom is based out of the revelation of his love toward us. And, I, and what I'm preaching to you tonight isn't, hey, God loves you so much so you can go do whatever you want to. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you may have messed up. You may have stubbed your toe, but your heart's still sensitive to God. His love toward you is not dictated by your performance. In other words, you can get back to the place where God can use you mightily despite what you've done. If you don't believe that, there's some religious people in this world that believe that God doesn't use people that have messed up. Uh, his top three guys were murderers before they were ministers. David, Moses, come on, Paul, you little righteous thing, or should I say self-righteous thing, God can use anybody if they keep their heart right and keep surrendered before him. Praise the Lord. Amen. Wow. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, there's an awesome scripture here. Let's go back to the beginning. Then God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the livestock of the earth. That was one of my favorite scriptures when I was riding bulls. You shall rule over every creepeth thing that creepeth upon the earth, right? So God creates man in his own image. In the image of God, he creates them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. And say this word with me, rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves upon the ground. This is God's intent when he makes man. This is God's intent. God takes man from the dust of the earth. And I think some people 
think that God blew Adam up like a balloon. You know, went down there and went, and Adam went like one of those things. Like, you know, a, a pair of water wings for the, the pool out here. It says God breathed into his nostrils. No, I have this, I have this sneaky suspicion because when God creates, he speaks. He doesn't, he doesn't necessarily breathe, you know. But words are carried by breath. That's how you can tell if somebody's got holy halitosis, right? When they talk to you, like, oh, man, you didn't brush your teeth, did you? That's why I always take a mint before I pray for people. So I want them to have a good spirit, not an evil spirit. The word spirit means breath, you know. So I get testaments. We can be so corny as Christians, can't we? And I think he picks man up after he forms him from the dust of the earth. And just like he created the earth, he said, man be, man was. He spoke and his breath carried the words and man became a living, speaking spirit. We've all heard that. God says, let us make him in our image and in our likeness. And then what? And let him rule. Let him reign. Let him take authority. Sometimes people come to Jesus. They come back to Jesus. They give their life to Jesus. But then they never rule. And they never reign. See, the revelation of the Father and the revelation of the kingdom go hand in hand. We come into relationship with a loving Father who believes in us, has our best interests at heart, made us fearfully and wonderfully. We're called according to his purpose, has plans for us to prosper, to be in good health, not to harm us, but to give us a hope and a future. Amen. Amen. Oh man, I'm preaching it now. Amen. And then we get a revelation of the kingdom that we shall reign in life through one Christ Jesus. Take dominion. Put down the devil's activity. Put down anything that would try and rip us off from our purpose. Praise God. Amen. That's what he said. He creates man in his image. And then he says, now rule. Yeah. Well, what's man do? Instead of rule, turns into a fool. Right? He says, don't eat the fruit. Well, what's Eve and Adam do? Eve goes over there, and she's tempted by the enemy, and he says, hey, you surely won't die. God just knows that if you eat of this, that uh, you'll be like him. Isn't it interesting that God, or the enemy tempted Eve to become something that she already was? She already was like God. They were made male and female in his image. He says, if you eat this, you'll be like God. And she goes, oh, it's a pretty good deal. You already are like God. The only difference between you and God is you aren't intimately acquainted with evil. And God wants to save that for himself because he knows that for you to be intimately acquainted with evil, now you have a, a dual standard here. Now you have two things you're worshiping. And God wants to keep us as far away from evil. Listen, God didn't save you in your sin. He saved you from your sins. God doesn't want you around sin. He doesn't want you around the enemy because he knows it'll pervert you. So what the enemy did was make God look like a taker when the whole time he was a savior. He was saving them from heartache and pain and shame and anguish and bitterness and hopelessness. Listen, Adam and Eve were in a perfect world and they never knew pain. They never knew shame. They never knew anger. They never knew bitterness. They never knew unforgiveness. Wouldn't that be nice? You realize if you go to heaven, you're not going to experience any of that either anymore? <sighs> wow. Wow. That's better than any Vegas trip. Yeah. Goodness. But if the enemy could swindle Adam and Eve out of a perfect state, how much more can he do with us? Right? He gets them to believe that if they eat this fruit, they'll be like God. And here's what's really crazy. 
Have you ever noticed this? She looks at the fruit, she goes, it's pleasing to the eye, it's good for gaining wisdom, and it's good for food. Um, the devil always wraps the same present, it's just in a different bow. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. It's good for wisdom, pride of life, good to the eye, it looks good. I don't think it was an apple, by the way. I have an extreme conviction it was a pomegranate. I do. You want to fight about it later? We will. You can think it's an apple. I think it's a pomegranate. They're better for you anyway. Prove me it's not true. No, just kidding. It's good to the eye. It's good for gaining wisdom. And it's good for food. No, it wasn't. God said don't, don't eat of it. None of it was good. It might have been good, but it wasn't God. How many things do we do that we think are good? And if they're good, they got to be God, but they're just good. They're not God. Because that was good, but it wasn't God. Oh, man, I'm preaching now. <laughs> oh, man, I heard somebody say this, and it rocked my world. They said, what if when we get to heaven, God reminds us of everything we did for him that he never told us to do? Because it was good, but it wasn't God. That was good, but they ate it and they fell. We have to obey God, not just obey good. Oof. Yeah. Soon as she picked up that fruit and ate of it, Adam turned to her and said, woman, you just ate us out of house and home. No, I, I thought Adam was off doing something in the garden. He was standing right there. He ate of it too. And they fell. Right? Did you know that the snake had feet? Did you know that? Because after God figures out this whole charade, he says, from now on, you will crawl on your belly. So the snake didn't crawl on its belly before that. So he was defeated. Must have been a centipede or something. <laughs> I know it's corny, but I just have fun with that. A lot of fascinating stuff in the, in the book of Genesis. And God redeems it. And God takes the skin of an animal and clothes them with the first fruit of a loom underwear. I think that animal was a lamb. And I think that lamb that was shed, the blood, was a temporary solution until the lamb of God would show up and forgive all of sin because God so loved the world. Isn't that awesome? It's awesome. But here's what's crazy. When they fell, when they ate that fruit, theologians will tell you that it was a lot more than oops, that sucks. That they went into deep depression and anguish. They fell. They went from the penthouse to the doghouse. And it was hard, especially probably on Eve. Because women are more emotional by nature. I bet she was wigged out, locked in the room. Adam's like, what do you want for dinner? Shut up! <laughs> I'm serious. It was bad. We have no idea how, how dark it was because here's what happened. They were in a perfect state. As soon as they ate that fruit, they knew evil intimately. Bam! All of a sudden, shame enters in. <gasps> we're naked. They didn't know they were naked before. Blame enters in. You! Adam blamed God and Eve. That woman that you gave me. Sometimes I say that about Jamie. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Blame, shame, anger, worry, unforgiveness, all entered in right there. They had never known that before. Can you imagine how depressing that would be? Well, we live in it every day. Oh, my goodness. And they went and they found fig leaves. And they covered themselves. 
with salad dressing. <laughs> I'm just going to keep bypassing it until you'll get it at three in the morning. <laughs> ranch. She thought ranch. I thought Dorothy Lynch. <laughs> salad dressing. All right, you'll get it. <laughs> Covered themselves with salad dressing because they thought that they had to cover themselves for sin. Come on, go with me here. They had to cover. And God, God comes in the cool of the day to meet with them. I never noticed this before. He comes up and he goes, Adam, where are you? Do you think God didn't know where they were? You think God was like, Adam, where'd he go? I just don't have, a, I just don't have the slightest idea where Adam went. The, the one who knows all things. I just don't understand where Adam went. God knew exactly where Adam was. He wasn't going, Adam, where are you? He was going, Adam, where are you for our time of fellowship? We have a divine appointment. We have a mandate. We're supposed to meet here. But you're not here. And Eve speaks up and says, well, we were naked, so we hid. God goes, who told you you were naked? And he could look at their salad dressing and he's going. That's what you're going to use to cover your sin. There's nothing you can do to cover your mess ups. So let me do it. The Lord will provide himself a lamb you can't cover your sin only God can cover your sin and he grabs a hold of this lamb that I think I think it was a lamb and he skins the lamb and says here put these on man they were Versace underwear wool but the blood that came from that lamb was the first drip that would start to pile all the way up through time, all the way through all the priests and Moses and all the sacrifices on the altar of incense and all the, uh, the altar outside. Every time they'd crush a lamb and that blood, it was just a big snowball until one day John the Baptist was out baptizing people And he sees Jesus and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world and puts every eye on the pole. Look to him. When you mess up, when you get bit, look to him. Because whosoever believes will not perish but have everlasting life. Are you looking to him? Are you looking to him? Amen. There's some people that they come to Jesus and they cross all their T's and dot all their I's and they think, thank God I'm not like them. <laughs> I have 356 golden stars in my attendance for church. <laughs> They're out there in the front smoking a cigarette while you're on your 28th cup of coffee. And we have this way in the church of marginalizing how good we are compared to, oh my goodness, them over there. And the Pharisees did that too. Can I just say, no matter how good of a church person you are, you are in desperate need of Jesus Christ every single day, every single minute, every single hour. Remember the woman that came and she broke the alabaster jar and she pulls it all over Jesus and she's crying and the Pharisees are sitting there going, ooh, if he, if he knew what a sinful woman she was, he would never let her touch him. And Jesus turns around with a vengeance and he goes, who do you think you are? 
this woman has done a beautiful thing. Leave her alone. She's prepared me for burial. And he says something profound. He says, those who are forgiven much love much. Doesn't he? And then he says to the woman, your faith has saved you. It wasn't her good works that saved her. It wasn't her church attendance that saved her. It wasn't how many times she served on the worship team that saved her. It wasn't how many scriptures she's quoted or how many days she's fasted that saved her. I'm not saying that those are bad things. I'm just saying it, none of those things saved her. Nothing saved her but looking at Jesus Christ. Your faith in me has saved you. And then he says something profound to everybody. He says, those who are forgiven much, love much. That's in the eyes of the beholder. Let me ask you, how forgiven are you? Because if you think, you know what? I've never been a really bad person. I was raised in church and I only stole a crayon in fifth grade. Other than that, I'm awesome. You still stink. There is none righteous, no, not one. All have fallen short of the glory of God. And as a matter of fact, the church person that never missed a Sunday might be so riddled with the spirit of pride that they don't realize the depths from whence they came and how much they've actually been forgiven. Because it was the prostitute that realized that God reached down to the deepest, darkest, miry clay and pulled her up and said, woman, your faith has saved you. And because you have been forgiven much and you know it, you will love much. Here's the key to loving people well is knowing how much you've been forgiven. And if you walk around with your nose in the air saying, I'm such a righteous person, you won't love hardly at all. But when you walk around going, man, God pulled me out of the miry clay, pulled me out of my self-righteousness and my own godliness and my pride and my rebellion against him. He did so much for me. You will love others much. It's interesting. It's usually those who have been through hell in the hallway that help others with the love of God. Can we go to one more scripture and we'll finish tonight? It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Wow. Everybody say, I've been forgiven much. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? If you realized what a stench you were to God before you came to Jesus. And I, and I mean this in the way, not that God, uh, God so loved you all the way before you were even a believer. God loved us while we were yet sinners, right? But there was no way that you could get close to God without Jesus Christ. Do you realize that when Jesus died on the cross, he became sin? He wasn't just dying for sin. He became sin. That's why Moses was told to put a snake up there, not a lamb, because Jesus literally became sin. He became what you and I were without him so that you and I could become the righteousness of God and go to heaven because of him. Does that make sense? Without Jesus, the wrath of God was barreling at you like a freight train and you were heading straight to hell. No matter how good you were, no matter how much you attended church, no matter how much your grandma played organ at the Lutheran church or the Baptist church or the Catholic church or any other church, no matter how good of grades you got and that you were an honor roll student and a good Sunday school student, or no matter how many crosses you had around your neck, without Jesus Christ, you were heading straight to hell. I don't, it's hard for people to believe that. They, they get mad about it. Like, you're being mean to me. No, I'm speaking truth to you. Jesus said, I am the, 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 no one comes to the, except, 
Does no one mean no one? I looked it up in the Greek. No one means no one. Zilt, nada, nobody. There's not all ways to heaven. There's one way. His name's Jesus Christ. And you ain't going until you know him. Can I say something about that? God's not, this is gonna surprise some more people tonight, but God's not trying to get you to heaven. God's trying to get you to himself. Because if he can get you to him, he can get you to heaven. But you can't get to heaven without him. A lot of people trying to get to heaven, but they don't want him. I want to go dancing through the tulips, and I want to have a life where I can just fly around and everything's wonderful. But, eh, I don't want to give my life to you. A lot of people say this kind of deep down. They probably would never voice it, but they say, Jesus, you can have my sin, but you can't have my life. Forgive me, but you can't have me. Jesus didn't die for your sin. He died for you. No, he didn't die to get your sin. He died to get you. He died for your sins, but he didn't die to get your sins. He died to get you. You get that? We hear this all the time. Jesus died for my sins. Jesus died for my sins. And inadvertently, subconsciously, we think, Jesus wants my sin. Why would we give Jesus what insults him most? Jesus doesn't want your sin. It's not like he's got a big sin collection in heaven and he can't wait to get yours because it's one of the rarest. Oh, look at this sin right here. Wow, that's a good one. Man. Oh, I love that sin. That's my favorite one right there. God doesn't want your sin. He hates your sin. And he's trying to get your sin as far away from you as possible because he wants to take your sin, throw it into the sea of forgetfulness so he can get you. Yeah. 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 And we have this soul mentality that God wants to get us to heaven when the whole time God wants to get us to him. Because <laughs> if he can get us to him, he can get us to heaven. Which presents another question. I I'm just saying things that you might not have thought about before. I didn't think about them until I finally thought about them. <laughs> Here's another question for you that you might not have thought about. Is God bigger than heaven or is heaven bigger than God? Is God bigger than heaven or is heaven bigger than God? Come on. God's bigger than heaven, right? God created heaven. How could heaven be bigger than God? So if God created heaven, then if I go to God, I'll get to heaven. But if I try and get to heaven without God, I won't go. I'll miss them both. But how many people do you and I both know that are trying to get to heaven without God? <laughs> Maybe heaven just is God. Because hell is a place without him. That's all hell is, is a place without God. You hear people say this, they go, oh, I'm just living in hell on earth. No, you're not. Because even the unrighteous have God on earth. God lets his reign come down on the righteous and the unrighteous. We have a lot more of God here, even if we don't believe in him, than we'll ever have in hell. When you go to hell, there's no stability, there's no sanity, there's no peace, there's no contentment, there's no air, there's no joy, there's nothing of God in hell because hell is a place without God. And people who want to live without God will go to the place that is without God. And people that want to... to uh, go to heaven and want to live with God, they will go to the place where God is. But people aren't going to go to heaven when they don't love God. My, my friend, Pastor Jeff Capella, I was talking to him, uh, Kobe about him. They're, they're so much alike. He's up in uh, North Dakota. He said something to me once. We do a burger run in Gray City. Gray City has this burger up in North Dakota. Make your tongue slap your brain. Man, so good. We were driving to get our, our burger, you know. And he says to me, you know what's funny to me or what's concerning to me? I said, what's that? He said, all these people that want to go to heaven, but they didn't want to know the leader of heaven while they were here. Wow. 
It shocked me. I thought, that's amazing. We might as well practice. We might as well have heaven on earth. Wow. We can know him right now. Well, let's read this and go on our way tonight. Everybody say, I'm so loved. And God created you to meet in the garden and to walk in the cool of the day. You know what was happening in the garden, by the way? This was Adam before he fell. You shouldn't be taller than me, son. I rebuke you. Get shorter in Jesus' name. If I'm the father, he's Adam. It's father and son. And God would come in the cool of the day and they would walk together. That's why God said, where are you? Because we have this time. This is our divine appointment. It's our mandate. Men, you're going to hear that a lot this weekend. The mandate. It's a date with God in in a good way, not a gross way. God was walking with Adam in the cool of the day. And look at this. Big King was downloading into Little King how to run his kingdom. God says, I got a kingdom in heaven and I run it good up there and I've given you the garden here on the earth. That's your kingdom. Take dominion. The word dominion is in the word kingdom. Kingdom is a derivative. The word dumb is not D-U-M-B. It's for dominion. King's dominion. King's domain. So when you have a kingdom, you have a domain, a place where a king rules and God said thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven and God came down in the garden and he would walk with Adam in the cool of the day and big king would tell little king how to run his kingdom and so it all started with I want a relationship with you and then out of that relationship you will rule and then it got all messed up so when Jesus comes back on the scene He says, now I'm going to restore that relationship. I'm going to be the medium between you and the Father. That's why we pray in Jesus' name. Because now when Jesus showed up, he restored that relationship to man. So now that you and I can have a personal relationship with Big King, And once again, God starts all over again because God so loved the cosmos the way he had it set up in the beginning that he gave his only son, that whosoever shall believe in him now shall have their relationship with the father restored. And now instead of calling him God, we can call him father and we can walk with him in the cool of the day and have relationship with him. And out of our relationship with him, big king will download into little king and we will reign in life through one Christ Jesus. Wow. Isn't that awesome? Thank you, sir. Let's read this together. In 2 Corinthians 5, 14, says, uh, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Isn't that amazing? Jesus died for us, that we should no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died for us. Amen. Verse 16. So from now on, no one, we, uh, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself. Notice the verbiage here. Not counting men's sins against them. And has committed unto us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. Why? Because God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Isn't that amazing? Can I ask you a question? Is there anything in there that talks about going to heaven? 
then why have we made this whole Christian experience about I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. <laughs> really? In the church today, we are so consumed with going to heaven that we forgot to bring heaven to earth. We are. We, it's all about, come up and say the prayer so you can go to heaven. Come up and say the prayer. Uh, am I going to heaven? I do a, a fad? I don't go to heaven? This isn't about going to heaven. The Bible says in John chapter 17, this is eternal life, that you may know him and his son, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Going to, it, it's not about coming up, praying a prayer, and then going to heaven. I'm good. Got my free e-ticket to heaven. And then I just sit in church and wait for the Holy Hoover to suck me out of here. I say that with all due respect. That's what the Christian life uh, has been boiled down to. And I hate to say that. I, I don't know if it's our evangelistic techniques or, or if it's man-made stuff, but we, it's all been boiled down to, hey, get them to come say a prayer, and then once they say the prayer, give them a New Testament Bible, slap them on the butt, tell them they're a part of the family of God, and let's just all wait until we go to this ethereal place. And the whole time, we, we're way away from God's heart. God's saying this. I sent Jesus to the cross so that you could believe in him. And what I was doing secretly and unbeknownst to the enemy was that I was reconciling men to myself in Christ. Not counting their sins against them that was God's intent not to get you to heaven get you to him you know what the word reconcile means it means to become friends with again have you ever kind of broke up with your your uh, friend I had a friend of mine his name was Seth and uh, we got in a bad tomato fight and I said, I don't want to be friends with you anymore. And I drove home and he stayed home. I was at his house. Well, his little sister came up with her basket on the front of her bike with a tape in it. That was back in the day when we had the little tape recorders and push play and record. And I put it in the recorder, I pushed play and he said, I'm sorry, I want to be your friend again. So I recorded a little bit and sent it back and it went in the basket. That was FedEx back then in the day on Garden Lane. <laughs> And then after he heard my tape and I heard his tape, we became friends again. We were reconciled. We were reconciled. Because of Adam and Eve, we were estranged in our relationship with God. But because of Jesus, God was reconciling us to himself in Christ that we might become friends again. And then here's what gets really cool. And he gives us the ministry of reconciliation. So we can go tell people, hey, guess what? You can be friends with God again. You can be reconciled to God. How? Through Jesus. God wants you to be your friend again. He wants to be in a relationship with you again. He wants to be your father. And guess what? Here's what's really cool. He's not counting your sins against you. I wonder what would happen if we really believed that we had the ministry of reconciliation versus the ministry of condemnation, which is, you don't quit that, you're going to hell. If you don't quit that, you're going to hell. Has that ever worked? I don't think I've ever heard somebody go, oh, thank you so much for telling me I'm smoking too many cigarettes. But I have had people say, you mean God loves me that much? I thought if I came through the door of this church, I was going to die. He was going to strike me down. No, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. And God so loves you that he gave his son to reconcile you to himself. God wants you. Amen. Wow. 
I don't know if we got anybody. Yeah, come on, brother. Thank you, Lord. God so loves you. God so loves you. God so loves you. I said God so loves you. God so loves you. (laughs) Does that make you want to do bad? That God so loves you? God so loves you. When you hear that, what do you think? God so loves me. And he's called me according to his purpose. Thank you, Lord. 